Thanks for joining me today for a look at concepts in scale and patterns in landscape ecology. So we know that there's an important element of scale uh, and a dependence on scale in ecology. Organisms tend to interact with, an, with the environment at a particular scale, and every pattern or process occurs at a characteristic spatial scale and temporal scale. Measurements are also scale dependent. So if we were to look at this figure in the grassy kind of field there, um, is this particular environment homogeneous or heterogeneous? Well, it would depend on the scale that you're looking at. If you're looking at the scale of the elephant, then this tends to be a quite homogeneous region. However, at the scale of uh, the cricket, off to the right-hand side there, there's a lot more heterogeneity within this environment. Concepts of scale are, are really important to denote because of the fact that we can uh, run into issues with the scale if we are not determining an appropriate temporal scale of certain processes. For example, in the figure off to the left, we have a horned lark, and if we know the geographic range of the individual, um, we still need to break that down into the local habitat, um, the territorial habitat of that organism, and finally the individual territory um, in order to determine processes such as nest site and display site and foraging area. So you need to, you can use information from one scale to address questions uh, at another one, but um, there are issues of scaling up and scaling down that you need to be concerned with. Well, first it's good to have an idea of definitions associated with certain terms. And, and we'll be talking about some of these terms as we go along during this talk, but just so you have a summary of that terminology here. So in this figure, we have characteristic patterns of scale that are important to recognize when you're conducting studies. Along the x-axis, you have spatial scale, which is in meters squared and is on a logarithmic scale, so it changes by a magnitude of 10 at each interval. Um, and repeats for each of these A through D sections. Along the y-axis, we have a temporal scale, which is, again, a logarithmic scale in years. And in this first section, it's important to note biotic as well as abiotic and um, geographic kind of activities and, and what kind of scale they occur at. Um, that may influence, and when you're during studies, it may influence the um, biological uh, characteristics in, in the patterns of scale in biological kind of characteristics such as species migration, succession, and things along those lines. Um, it's also important to understand terrestrial vegetation and the magnitude of scale uh, from the level of the tree through to the biome. And then finally, uh, just measures of of, of data collection are indicated in this fourth panel, D, uh, with remote sensing as well as data that's collected at the mesoscale, microscale, macroscale. So patterns of scale um, are going to have uh, sometimes overlap between environmental and biological elements, and sometimes there's going to be uh, not so much overlap. So it's important to understand those patterns ahead of conducting ecological studies. We've got a couple examples here just to kind of demonstrate this whole concept of scale and patterns. In a study by Chase and Leobold in 2002, they took a look at pond samples for animal species and primary producers, so photosynthesizing organisms. And they found that diversity and productivity measured at the level of the pond locally, and they also um, collected information uh, at the level of regional level of the watershed. And in terms of the alpha and the gamma diversity, and alpha diversity is uh, within a particular region, uh, the gamma diversity is going to be within the whole ecosystem, there is a clear diversity to productivity relationship that is scale dependent. Um, so we, we find that there's a relationship be at these two different levels. However, when we go to look at the diversity at the beta level, the ponds in productive watersheds had less similar species composition. 
Remember that beta diversity is the ratio between the regional and the local species diversity. Um, and it's going to be high in more productive watersheds. So it didn't have the same relationship in the data at this particular scale as it did in the micro and kind of macro scale. This meso or the middle scale kind of, uh, I guess, equivalent had a different relationship and pattern in the, in the data. And competition can also be scale dependent. Um, we find that there's something called a parent competition where there's a pattern that looks like competition, but it's due to another process. So in a scenario where there's two species, you might have one species that increases um, over time and another decreases, which would suggest upon initial look that the first is a more successful competitor. However, if you back up and look at a larger scale, um, the decrease you find can be potentially due to some other artifacts, such as the first species having an effect on predation rates of another. And this is demonstrated in an example of aphids, leafhoppers, and nabids <laughs> by Osman and Ives in 2003. So we've got our aphids in the left-hand side associated with this little bush, and the leafhoppers on the right-hand side, and this nabid is going to be the predator. So at the small scale, the nabids uh, are able to move between these two plants. So if you're looking just in the, in terms of um, at the plant level of scale, then you potentially would not see that the nabids are going to be able to move across a larger scale and inhabit a larger scale and um, perhaps would miss the fact that nabids prefer aphids uh, when they're attracted and thus are attracted to plants with aphids and move away from plants without them. The other element of their study indicated that at the large scale, the nabids are generally going to be attracted to fields that have more af aphids in it, which means that those fields are going to have increased leafhopper predation just by sheer fact that the nabids are going to be present within that field as opposed to another that has fewer of these uh, aphids present. So the, one species is actually having an effect on predation of another species simply by those predators being opportunistic and being within a certain field due to the composition or the, um, sorry, the presence of the uh, first species. So if you don't look at that larger scale picture, then you, you miss these actual processes that are occurring due to predation as opposed to competition. Predictability is possible uh, within concepts of scale. We can predict the probability of an occurrence in models, uh, but that's going to rely heavily on knowledge of the frequency of an event happening, such as mutation rate in biological organisms or some other factor. Ecological processes can consist of both predictable and unpredictable conditions. And when, when we use models for being able to predict certain outcomes, there's going to be a wide variety of elements that are incorporated in those models. In habitat models, you have elements of the, of the individual and population that contribute to habitat availability and preference and habitat use. Um, so there's some elements of these that, that flow down and, and are, are incorporated into habitat models. And in population models, there's obviously going to be an influence by these, this habitat preference and these variables um, that need to be considered when looking at the population dynamics. Uh, so there's an interconnectedness between these different variables. And if you have some idea about their occurrence, you can um, utilize models. And it's one area of ecology where there's quite a bit of um, activity in model development. Some of the predictable versus unpredictable variables, uh, again, they're going to be related upon scale. So climate tends to be predictable, although weather is not. Overall vegetation, so shrub, tree, things along those lines, is predictable, whereas the plant species composition of a small plot is going to be unpredictable. And lastly, a persistence of a, over time of a metapopulation is something that is predictable. And again, a metapopulation is going to be a group of subpopulations within a region. 
Um, however, the extinction or colonization of these particular specific subpopulations in a metapopulation are going to be unpredictable. So those larger scale elements tend to be predictable where the smaller scale ones are not. Uh, we, it's important to look at and understand elements of scale as well, the most important of which are going to be grain and extent. Uh, the grain is going to refer to the minimum spatial resolution of the data in a raster. We've been referring to that as, as cell size in our lab materials. Um, and this also can refer to the observation point size. So at what level are you collecting a measurement? The extent refers to the study area or the landscape size. And if we take a closer look at changes in grain size and extent, um, as you can see in the top figure, figure A, an increase in the grain size is going to decrease the resolution and thus decrease the heterogeneity of a particular, um, of a particular extent or region. And by contrast, if you have maintained that grain size, and increase the extent, you're going to result, uh, the results will be that you'll have an increase in that heterogeneity. So it's important to recognize the relationship between those two. So uh, the grain and the grain size and uh, the extent can range from fine to coarse, and there's going to be um, uh, kind of a, a correlation between those factors. We also talk in terms of absolute and relative scale. An absolute is going to be the actual distance or shape or geometry, whereas that relative scale is going to be the direction, um, the relative distance or direction, um, and it's based on some functional relationship to the organism or the process. So how impactful is this concept of scale? Well, as scale changes, patterns and processes change. So biological interactions are going to decouple from environmental features as you change into larger scales. Uh, as, you sc as scale changes, the system may actually switch between an open and a closed scale. Um, an open ecosystem is going to have an exchange of energy, material, and organisms, whereas a closed scale is going to um, only have an exchange of energy, typically. Um, we also find that as scale changes, Statistical relationships may change between organisms, and, and this can either um, be a decrease or an increase in the relationship, whether there's a positive influence um, at one scale versus another or, or a switch to a negative. And in this example, the least flycatcher has a negative correlation to the American red start tree at the, um, at the small scale, local scale, However, at the regional scale, there's a positive correlation. So there's an increase in those flycatchers with an increase in red start. Uh, we also have to recognize that there are changes in scale. This is going to require transformation. If you're working in one scale and need to transfer to another, you're going to need to have some way of transforming your data. Scaling techniques are important to, to understand, and there's a various methods, mechanisms by which you can um, work at different types of spatial scale, which include the points, linear networks, continuous surfaces, and categorical mosaics. Um, and these scaling techniques or spatial statistics can be used in order to describe a spatial correlation and pattern in the data, to choose an optimal experimental design, to model correlated measurement error or to interpolate data and construct contour maps. So when we are when we have those calculations and we and we have those metrics we're working with, we need to understand different forms of changing scale. There is one mechanism by which you can directly extrapolate or scale up based on a set of measurements or a single measurement. Um, in this particular figure, we have two measurements taken at point A and point B. Um, and interpolation is really going to be a value that is derived by, uh, by averaging or finding some, some uh, performing some calculation using that information. However, an extrapolation at point D 
is using one bit of information and assuming that relationship continues uh, and persists. So, for example, if we had 10 birds per hectare and we wanted to extrapolate that to, um, uh, to kilometers, square kilometers, we would just multiply uh, how many hectares there are in square kilometers and get 1,000 birds per kilometer. Now, you can imagine there's some issues that arise because of this. Um, so more frequently, it's important to understand and use nonlinear scaling, an example of which is the species per area curves. So in species richness or biodiversity, um, there is not a linear scale that occurs over a large, over a large range of areas. Uh, small plots are unlikely to contain multiple species, and as you increase your plot size, species accumulate rapidly. So that rate of accumulation is ultimately going to decline with increasing size. So you don't have this ability to extrapolate or to uh, scale up easily. The data in these particular scenarios is represented on a logarithmic scale. So along the x-axis, we have area and kilometers on the log scale. And along the y-axis in this figure, we have number of species on the logarithmic scale as well. Um, if we, oh, sorry, for b, we don't have it on the logarithmic scale, but it is um, kind of transformed slightly there if you look at the scale. So if you look at... Um, if you look at species richness on a logarithmic scale when, and, and, and look at the area of those species, um, we see that in the first example, or example A and example C here, we have the ability to see that there is a logarithmic change in the one variable versus the other, and those plots result in a straight line. So you can use this information to uh, calculate species richness from these log-to-log -log plots. And you would have to calculate the normal log of the number of species, natural log of the number of species by using the formula um, m equals the natural log of the area plus b. And a regression would give us that, um, which is just a form of statistical analysis, multivariate analysis would give us that, um, those two values of m and b. Fractal scaling is another concept we can use. An observation has a degree of self-similarity across a range of spatial scales or resolutions. So a small piece of an object is going to look like a larger piece of the whole. So when we're talking about this in terms of landscape structure, we can use power functions to change the scale and obtain accurate measurements, no matter what the measurement resolution. So in this example here, we have the coastline length, which is dependent on the measurement resolution. So in the figure to the left, you have a course measurement, which results in us not being able to capture the variability along that coast, as opposed to the final figure where there's a small, smaller scale of measurement. Uh, we need to calculate the fractal dimension, which is going to be the shapes between the straight line and the simple geometric objects. And in this particular calculation, it's obtained by fitting a regression line for the log value of the coastline length as a function of the log ruler length or the measurement length. It allows um, us to see that there are consistent scaling relationships which means that we can calculate the coastline length at any ruler length when we have this information. And we can do that using this particular equation. Fractal scaling of an area is also possible and useful for shapes that are not regular, such as a square with a square hole in the middle. And um, in this particular example, you don't necessarily have a straight line or a geometric shapes such as a square that is completely filled in. So you do have to make a bit of transformation and a bit more calculation here. But in objects where the fractal scaling is self-similar, so there's a similarity between the individual observations versus the total area, you can extrapolate and obtain information on the uh, overall kind of metrics associated with that area if you know something about the individual 
data. The scale selection is an important thing to understand in determining the right scale to use. And uh, scale of the data must ultimately match the scale of the process of interest. However, it has to be a fine enough resolution so that differences can be observed and coarse enough so that patterns are not obscured by noise. And by noise, um, this figure kind of gives us a demonstration of that. In the top panel, we have temporal variability where there is noise persistent at the smaller scale, a pattern present at the mesoscale, and uh, background at the macro scale. So in frequency patterns, there are, um, the background is going to refer to uh, uh, things like climate change. So they're so large that you kind of lose any possible patterns there. Uh, in the spatial variability panel to the bottom, the spatial pattern is going to emerge at a certain spatial scale and resolution, below which there will be noise, which is the natural variability that occurs within environmental or biological data, um, and above which, above the pattern of interest, uh, we will have something such as environmental background, where you can't differentiate any kind of pattern. So setting a scale relevant to the species of interest and the activity, such as movement patterns, for instance, is really critical. Once you have an idea of that, you can um, map out the predictability related to those two elements, the spatial and temporal scale, and that helps you to determine a time scale of interest or a spatial scale of interest. It's also helpful to understand the hierarchical framework that exists within ecology. And essentially, ecosystems do not exist in this isolation, in silos. They're nested in larger ecosystems that influence the processes of the ecosystems below them. So if you are trying to, uh, if your objective is to, for instance, predict the increase in biomass of a forest stand at a time scale of approximately 100 years, you would largely be interested in phenomena such as leaf area and the average tree diameter for your data collection. However, you should keep in mind and, and what can, those elements that contribute to this, um, this phenomena, which is going to be mechanisms by which the whole tree physiologically exists, um, annual productivity and root respiration. So that's a whole level just below the level of it, of observation that you're conducting your study at. And then um, in terms of the level above, the landscape kind of perspective, um, you have to think in terms of the um, evolutionary responses of the trees and other elements of the ecosystem that might be um, contributing to the phenomena that you're studying. So the emphasis on logical links among different scales is important because although the scale of an event defines the observational level, so in this example, the, the stand or the collection of trees of a similar age, composition, and species, um, the next lower level usually provides components of that event and mechanistic explanations, um, whereas the higher or coarser scale, higher levels or coarser scale is going to provide context for the event that you're studying. So it's important to understand how that hierarchical framework contributes to your study. There are several causes of landscape patterns. And when we study landscape patterns, we typically need to emphasize spatial patterns or the distribution of elements and temporal patterns or such as disturbance and succession and climate change. There are interactions that occur between the spatial and temporal elements on both short and long time scales. As part of the, um, the spatial elements, we have abiotic factors that contribute to this, this particular element of scale. This includes climate, temperature and pre precipitation, uh, landforms, so the natural features of the Earth's surface, and soils such that you 
have these various different habitats and ecosystems that exist, such as plains and plateaus and mountains and valleys. As you can see in the image to your right hand side, those different ecosystems are distributed throughout the, the planet and they are going to be influenced by other effects, some of which are climate effects. Climate is impacted by the presence of moisture in the air or lack thereof. So the not only the precipitation, but the, the potential for moisture to exist within a habitat is important. Additionally, there's the element of altitude and latitude that can influence the ecosystem and the ecology that exists there. So as you increase in altitude, you typically increase in or change from one form of ecosystem to another. And a similar thing happens at the, the latitudes where there's a change in the change in the temperature as well as moisture in the air again, precipitation. The landform is going to consist of elevation or relief effects. Uh, this can influence the air, the ground, or water temperatures. It can influence the amount of run on or run off and the solar radi radiation that's present. So these factors in turn are going to influence organisms that occupy this land. There's another pattern that occurs, uh, something we refer to as zonation. This is essentially where patterns are observed in a community with distance and along environmental gradients. And in particular, we have vertical zonation, which can refer to changes in horizontal bands. So there is not only the vertical zonation, which is attributable to changes in altitude, but also latitudinal zonation that can occur. Another element contributing to landscape patterns are biotic factors. This is going to include species interactions with the environment or with other species. Uh, keystone predators, which are species that, or keystone species, which are ones that um, other organisms in an ecosystem largely depend on, are typically responsible for these larger scale changes. However, it, interactions between individuals can form different patterns, methods of uh, mechanisms of competition and predator prey relationships, grazing and territory can territoriality can actually contribute to these patterns as well. Um, in the example we have here, there is a beaver dam located in Alberta, Canada, which can actually be seen from space and has a pretty large impact or influence on the pattern located within this wetland region. Ecologists oftentimes will use these abiotic and biotic factors in order to inform models. Models are going to be different algorithms or, or computational elements that allow us to understand patterns present within an ecosystem. And it's largely dependent on the individual interactions in the environment that cause those patterns to form. So one example is SORTI, which is an individual-based forest model developed by Dushman and Pakala. Uh, this incorporates elements of light and growth and mortality and reproduction uh, within the models. The SORTI model can actually utilize several parameters and species in order to model what or predict what uh, collections of trees are going to exist within a certain ecosystem. So for instance, in this particular example, uh, it's taking a look at the local and mean field forests at a thousand years. Um, on the left-hand side, you have two different scenarios, a scenario where there's no disturbance that occurs and a scenario where there is uh, some disturbance that occurs within the, that has occurred within the forest. Um, off to the right hand side is another kind of modeling parameter that can be calculated to look at the mean kind of distribution with, with each of those scenarios. Um, in this particular example, we, the model takes a look at mortality and what that mortality looks like in a scenario where there's no disturbance 
uh, with several species present as well as a scenario where there is disturbance. So basically these models incorporate several different elements and components that are present and known data from the region and uses that to predict what might happen at the end of a 100-year simulation, 1,000-year simulation. So it's one ways we can use patterns in order to um, form predictions. There are more patterns formations that occur aside from these kind of tree assemblages. And um, one example here is the shrub and arid ecosystem. On the local scale, there's an influence on the increase of water filtration and it promotes other shrubs from occurring or promotes other shrubs occurring. And on the larger scale, roots are going to harvest that surface water from between, from between patches, and this is going to inhibit germination. So just knowing something about the pattern on the local and larger scale can give you, uh, can inform these types of models. In a second scenario here, we have a mussel bed in a soft substrate. And a one kind of predictive factor at the local scale can be that uh, we know that muscles attach to each other for protection. And on the larger scale, there's going to be competition in these regions for algae from the water and uh, the prevention of clustering from other muscle organisms. So these pattern information relate, relating to these pattern formations um, can be helpful in kind of predicting how how these models will or how the um, ecosystems will function after time. Finally, we touch on disturbance, and disturbance is an ecological important situation because of the fact that uh, landscape disturbance results in the creation of open spaces. It can influence succession as well as different combinations of organisms that exists within these habitats or within these ecosystems. Um, ultimately, it's going to drive evolutionary processes as well. And again, we have several different terms that are used throughout the next couple slides and uh, important kind of set of, set, of, set of terms here are the small, medium, and large disturbances. Small disturbances are just going to consist of birth and death processes at the individual level, so very kind of small scale. Medium disturbances include insect outbreaks or small fires or floods. And larger disturbances are ones we typically think of as more catastrophic, such as hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, things along those lines. So there's this equilibrium that exists between the, um, the steady state and the stability of species composition, relative abundances, and stand age distribution. And um, it's important to know that in a landscape, Oftentimes, you will have a shift in something called the shifting mosaic, which is in this figure, you'll see that there are th three different periods of time, and um, at each period of time, you have the same contribution of different stand age assemblages um, at the same percentage rate or proportion rate. Uh, however, even though there's a constant composition through time of these different mosaics, there is a shifting configuration. So the series of panels with the arrows on the top shows how that, that, um, that configuration of the different uh, stands or the different groups of trees and brushes and things like that, or bushes and things like that, are going to shift over time within a certain region. Disturbance and recovery dynamics are important to understand uh, because of the fact that there can be a strong influence on the vegetation found at a site. These natural disturbances can include things like drought, fire, tornado, and blizzards. Um, ultimately, they lead to succession within those habitats, and the succession can either be um, relevant or, or observed at the small scale, uh, where you have gap dynamics and an increase in the alpha diversity uh, observed at the mid-scale level where there's going to be changes in the patches of vegetation and increased beta and gamma diversity. And finally, 
uh, larger kind of resets of a region to earlier successions or a decrease in diversity. So discovery, I'm sorry, disturbance and succession can have different influences depending on what scale you're looking at. And that is kind of largely communicated in this figure as well, where you have disturbance of the extent over the lab landscape extent on the x-axis and the disturbance interval over the recovery interval in the on the y-axis. So with different scales, um, you, you have different contributions in terms of the effect of disturbance. Recovery and, or sorry, the interval between disturbances is also something that's um, contributed to by this particular by scale. There are also anthropogenic effects that occur within a habitat uh, or with an ecosystem. Prehistorically, we have, humans have contributed changes to the land through agriculture, which involves the clearing of plants. There's been an extent extension over time of favorable plant ranges and over-harvesting of those favorable trees that naturally exist. Um, prehistoric human land use has uh, led to widespread weedy species distribution and either the depletion or enrichment of certain soils. And ultimately, there's been large changes to the land mosaic. Modern human land use contributes to this as well, but in slightly different ways. The present day settlement patterns take up more space per individual and some of the changes that occur due to human land use are irreversible, including clearing of wetland and such. Um, there's a large influence in fragmentation by modern human land use and we'll touch more on that later. Several different mechanisms of anthropogenic disturbances include development, air pollution, invasive species, and habitat fragmentation. Fire disturbance is a commonly studied form of disturbance, and um, there are actually some beneficial elements to fire disturbance within an ecosystem. Ecosystems tend to be adapted to fire, and some plants even require it for germination, such as the Chamaerops humilis found in the Mediterranean ecosystems. Grazing animals oftentimes benefit from the post-fire growth, and there's a pattern to the landscape that can emerge um, and persist over time, such as this mosaic caused by the 1988 Yellowstone fire. Um, this image is taken 30 years on after that, so the pattern that, um, or the mosaic that was caused by that fire persists to this day. Ecosystems are often influenced by the severity, the frequency, or the intensity of fire. And fire suppression is one way in which the ecosystems are also, contrib are also um, Im impacted or influenced. Um, so when fire suppression in a fire-adapted ecosystem occurs, it leads to an increased understory growth of the plants that exist below the trees, an increased density of the trees, a decrease in the fire adapted species and an increase in shade tolerant species. Uh, in this particular example of the Ponderosa pine forest, we see a typical kind of post fire scenario on the left hand side and a fire suppressed scenario on the right hand side. And you can kind of see the clear development of that undergrowth uh, a little bit better in the right hand image. There are problems that occur when fire can't suppress burns. Essentially, this results in something called a crown fire, which is where the burn happens up in the canopy of the trees, which can result in the killing off of mature trees, which is much more damaging to the, to the forest. Uh, reducing the fire frequency tends to increase the extent and the intensity or the severity of the fires. So having regular kind of recurring fires is actually beneficial in a way for these forests. There's several trends we can observe in fire disturbances. In the Peavine Creek fire patterns, on the top we have a series of historical fire maps and on the bottom we have more current day fire maps. Um, as, it, as you can see from the, the lower regions, elements of, of crown fire and flame length on the right hand side, 
uh, as well as structure on the far left, those are all much, well, the, sorry, the crown fire and the flame length are, are more in the very higher severe um, kind of range. Whereas historically, there was uh, a lot more even distribution of the intensity of these you know, elements. On the left-hand side, with respect to structure, the stand is going to be, um, or the structure of the forest is going to be predominantly younger forest, whereas you had more of a variety and diversity in the historical maps of this Peavine Creek region. The stand age, or the mean age of the forest stand, um, or the number of years after a major stand replacement, after disturbance, can be influenced. So in this particular example, by Minach and Chow in 1997, we have the stand age, stand age in years on the right-hand side, represented by the color scale. And you can see how the stand mosaic pattern is different on either side of that international border which is interesting. And um, the other thing that's important to note is that fire suppression in the north appears to promote more extensive burns that are harder to control than is occurring in the southern part of this map. Um, you can also see a large distribution of the much younger forest stands because of that. River disturbance is another element that can contribute to the landscape ecology. Uh, river flow regimes are important to understand. Stream flow has a large effect on the stream morphology and thus the habitat surrounding it. The speed and the volume of discharge is going to typically vary with rainfall and the discharge is going to influence the sediment that's carried by the water. High discharge or flooding events typically result in an overflow of the banks, um, but also are responsible for redistributing sediments and maintaining some of these habitats. Altered river regimes are actually predominant within the United States. Um, most, most rivers have been heavily altered with the implementation of dams and, and the control of the boundaries of those rivers. Of about 600,000 miles of rivers, about 17% of these lie behind 60 to 80,000 dams. This is gonna regulate the flow of water, which ultimately is going to um, prevent some of the small scale flooding that occurs. It's estimated that only about 18% of rivers in North America are free flowing at this time. There are several benefits to flooding. In general, an increased floodplain will increase habitat protection and because of this, there are managed floods that occur along these controlled rivers. Big floods tend to be economically damaging and dangerous. And with these large regulated rivers, people can control, uh, uh, mimic the natural flooding regime by having these controlled floods with a lower peak. In essence, this is going to allow for some of these natural processes to occur without it getting out of control and having negative effects outside of these benefits. So an example would be the Colorado River. At the Glen Canyon Dam, there's a trap of sediment which reduces and stabilizes that flow. The natural sediment cycles are uh, interrupted by this particular dam. So they've attempted to have several controlled floods because of that. Uh, the expected benefits of controlled flooding include allowing for a large flood stage release from the dam, redistribution of sediments, rebuilding of sandbars and beaches, as you can see in the figure to the right, after the flood, there's an increase in those sandbars, and an increased river depth, which restores the temperature distribution. So that's a little bit about disturbance, and I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Mm -hmm.